Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. Today, we have Jared Dillian. Jared cut his teeth on the trading room floor starting in 1999 and was an ETF trader for Lehman Brothers until 2008. He's the author of multiple books and editor of the Daily Dirt Nap, a daily newsletter for investment professionals. Jared, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, of course. Glad to be here. Yes. Um, being this is your first time on the show, maybe you could just give us uh, two minutes and tell your story and how you got into economics and finance. Well, out of high school, I went to the Coast Guard Academy. I, I used to be in the military. I was in the Coast Guard, uh, majored in math and uh, graduated. And I was assigned to a cutter in Washington State and started getting interested in finance and you know, quickly figured out that the Coast Guard wasn't for me and I wanted to work on Wall Street. Um, got stationed in the San Francisco Bay Area, worked as worked on the Pecoast Options Exchange, uh, and then got the job at Lehman Brothers where I did index arb and ETF trading. Um, you know, had a great career there, left at the bankruptcy, started the Daily Dirt Nap. I've been doing that for the last 15 years. Like you said, I've written four books. The newest one is coming out in January. It's called No Worries, How to Live a Stress-Free Financial Life. Awesome. Uh, well, I bet your math major has really helped you with uh, with your finance background. So um, what what did you specialize in certain ETFs when you worked for Lehman Brothers or was it just kind of across the board? Well, you know, keep in mind that when I started on the ETF desk, there was about 250 ETFs. And when I left, there was about 600. And now there's thousands of them. Yeah. But we made, we made markets in all of them. But it, the ETF world was very different back then. It hadn't really caught on with retail investors as a way to accumulate assets. They were really more of trading tools for hedge funds. So, you know, throughout the 2000s up until about 2009, ETFs really did not gather any assets. Um, and that changed, obviously. And now they have like seven and a half trillion in assets. Yeah, I think there's thousands of them now. I um, What? Uh, yeah, right on. Um, OK, um, people ask me since I started this show a few years ago, they asked me about little um, life hacks that they could do to make more or to save more money. And, uh, you know, little things like uh, making their own coffee instead of going to Starbucks. And but then when we look over their financial statement, we see some some huge, uh, you know, like student loans. We see um, uh, car loans or even worse, like uh, they're not they're not even going to own their car someday. They're, they're actually renting it through a lease. Uh, maybe you can go into that because you talk about, you know, you need to get the big things right you know, the house, the car, the student loans, and, and then it's not going to matter how much you spend on a cup of coffee. Yeah. I mean, Amer Americans, you know, our culture is such that we're taught that we're, we should focus on the little things. And if you fo focus on the little things, the, you know, the small habits, um, then the big things work themselves out. There was a speech a few years ago by a Navy Admiral. His name was Admiral McRaven. I think he spoke at Texas A&M at their commencement. And he, he gave this speech about how if you make your bed in the morning, then the rest of your day is going to be fantastic. Just focusing on that small thing. But if you do the math on this, if you start to do the math on this, you're like, okay, I'm going to buy a coffee every day from Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. So the coffee is $3.70. I do that every work day. So 250 days a year. So that's 900 bucks a year times 40 years over my entire life, that's $36,000. And if I invest that $36,000 at a, you know, rate of return of like 10% or something, then I have $150,000. So if you give up giving, if you give up drinking coffee, you will have $150,000 in retirement. So the math, the math is real. The math checks out, it makes sense. But the problem with that is, People cannot give up small daily luxuries. They can't. They can't sustain that program over time because you'll be miserable. What they can do is give up a large luxury, right? So if you got a 2,400 square foot house instead of a 2,800 square foot house, you're not going to be miserable in that house. You're not going to be like, this house sucks. It's too small or whatever. And if the house costs $100,000 less, then you will save $120,000 in interest 
on that loan just by getting a smaller house, which is essentially three lifetimes worth of coffee. <laughs> so the little stuff is little stuff and it doesn't matter. It's the big stuff that matters. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. That is uh, very, very true. Um, okay. Um, talking about bonds, I know you follow bonds quite a bit. Um, it, looking back over history, when the Fed has had a rate hiking cycle and then they pause, if I'm not mistaken, I believe, I believe the longest pause that they've had is like seven months. Is seven that... months, that's right, yeah. Okay, seven months, all right. I think if you average those out over the last hundred years or so, the average is like five months long, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, our last rate hike was uh, July, what was it, July 26th. Um, the, the next meeting when they paused, we, we said, we're like, okay, they're done. They're not hiking anymore, right? That, that was it. And now that's been about four months or so. Uh, we're approaching the average five month mark. The longest we know so far is seven months. What, what, what do you, what do you see unfolding here? Well, you know, I kind of have this trade on, you know, I'm long a bunch of two-year notes and I have been for a while on the idea that the Fed would cut sooner than people expected. Um, you know, if you go back last month, the first rate cut was priced in in August and then it was June and now people are talking about March. Um, I think it's possible it could be January. I mean, you know, we have payrolls coming up this week. We have two payroll numbers, one in December, one in January. Like if, you know, if they're both terrible, then yeah, it's possible that the Fed cuts in January. Uh, but even still, if they cut a March, also great, you know, like that's, that's seven months. So um, yeah, I've been following this for a while and, you know, we're recording today. The bond market is kind of repricing today. The bond market got a little bit ahead of itself. Uh, Ten-year notes are down, the yields are up about 10 basis points. So yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll share my uh, screen here. This is like catnip for our uh, listeners. Um so basically, where are we here? Here's the uh, ten year, um, and yeah, it's uh, it kind of shot down a tiny bit, and then the uh, uh, the two year. So this is one that you've been in for. Um, when when did you start buying these back here? Just as the yield started to go up? Uh, yeah, about three months ago. I've been averaging into it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you've been collecting four and a half to five percent, huh? Yep. Okay. Now here's the. Um, tens minus the twos and we're finally starting to approach this zero line up here you know we're starting to get a uh, uh you know it's it, uninvert i guess if that's a word um what uh wh what do you see with this you just see it keep going and then uh do you see a recession happening as soon as we uh, cross over that that zero mark yeah, I don't know about the timing of a recession. I mean, I mean, it's it's not even a hundred percent guaranteed that we're going to get a recession. But usually, when the yield curve is inverted for a period of time and then it uninverts, that's usually when the recession happens. So, um, what you need in order for that to happen is for short-term rates to come down a lot faster than long-term rates, and that really hasn't been happening. You know, even as yields have come down. Um, it's really been more of a parallel move in the curve. Um, but you, what you need is for two-year yields to come down very fast and to start pricing in rate cuts. Okay. So, And that hasn't happened yet, not really. Okay, okay. All right, now we'd be remiss not to talk about this one, uh, gold. Uh, so we we labeled this this last triple top here. We, we This is the COVID one right here. And then we got the uh, war premium when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. And then this last one, we labeled bank failures. What happened here uh, over the weekend when it, uh, you know, it shot up uh, the futures market up to 2150 and then uh, corrected back down? What, what, what should our fourth label be here? Do you think Are people finally waking up about inflation or? Well, I mean, that was last night. And, you know, in Asia, obviously, there were some stops above 2075 in spot. And somebody triggered the stops and they traded up to like 2150 in futures. I think spot got up to like 2135. Um, and that is an ugly candle. Like what you've seen is a massive outside reversal. Yeah. Um, it's about like the ugliest technical formation that you can possibly have. 
Uh, you know, I'm long a bunch of gold and I, you know, I've been pretty happy until recently. Uh, I'm a little worried about going forward about what this means for gold. Um, I think today really what's going on is, you know, you've had a surge in all assets, stocks, bonds, gold, Bitcoin, everything has gone up in the last couple of months because we're starting to price in these rate cuts. And I think today when gold did the outside reversal, everybody's looking at this and they're like, you know, maybe the market has moved too far too fast. And, you know, twos are down about seven ticks on the day. Like it's been a big repricing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you could see some, some kind of short-term correction here in gold. I mean, that is, that is an impressive bar right there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of what classical technical analysis tells you, you know, that's, that's called an outside reversal. And um, yeah, it's not, it's not bullish. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we saw the RSI and the MACD are getting pretty stretched. Uh, okay, what, uh, what do you follow in the uh, in silver here, we kind of, as you know, we've been following this market about, I don't know, three years or so, and it really seems like gold kind of moves first and then silver follows sometimes at an exponential move. Uh, silver also had a, uh, a reversal bar, um, a bearish reversal bar to the downside as well. Well, first of all, we got to play show and tell. I got to show you my uh, oh, yes. 100, ounce, 100 ounce silver bar right here. There we go. That's Johnson yep. Matthey. Yep. Yep. I <laughs> love those. Very stackable, very stackable. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, you know, silver, silver has been a huge disappointment over the last 12 years. I mean, you know, when gold got up to 1900 in 2011, silver got up to 50 and, mm -hmm. you know, here gold is put in a higher high and silver is half of where it was in 2011. Um, I don't really trade a lot of silver. I have a small position. Um, but I, actually I pro I probably have more physical silver than I have ETFs. Um, but, um, the, the thing I like about silver is that it's a right tail asset. And if you look at a chart of silver over time, like going back to the 1970s, it has a very large right tail. It has the ability to explode higher, right? Yeah. Which, you know, from a portfolio theory standpoint, is a really useful asset to have if you have something that has a large right tail. So you all, you always have to you, you you have to own some. You have to own some. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, do you follow uh, a platinum at all? Uh, you know, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because I pulled up a chart of it uh, yesterday uh, just to look at it because I hadn't looked at it in a while. Um, it's looking kind of interesting. It's looking kind of interesting. I mean, you know, platinum obviously is very cheap relative to gold, but yeah. you know, I think, I think, you know, one of the uses for platinum is in catalytic converters and there's just a lot more EVs being made right now. And I think that's probably 90% of the story. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Here's the platinum to gold uh, ratio and we're at uh, uh, two platinum coins for one gold coin. And if we go up here to the, the 2.0, it's it's the other way around. It's uh, two gold coins for one platinum. Um, you're right about the EV story. They don't need uh, a whole lot of platinum for catalytic converters in an electric vehicle because it doesn't have any exhaust. Um, I guess this might be a bet on the, on the other side of that, that we're actually going to continue having more internal combustion engines than, than the EV narrative uh, taking off. Well, I think, I think, you know, with platinum below a thousand, you kind of, you kind of have to say, gee whiz, like, you know, from an investment standpoint, like, you know, platinum is used for industrial purposes, but it's also used for investment purposes. Like, you know, $900 platinum is pretty cheap. Um, you know, it's almost, it's almost like kind of like a value play, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, what do you see in crude oil here? Um, so this is uh, in crude. Let me go to the daily here. Um, kind of setting up an interesting uh, uh, double bottom right here. Um, what, uh, what, do, what do you see as far as crude? If, if we do get a recession, which is probably a 95% chance, uh, maybe, maybe you got a different number. That's about what we got. 
uh, if we do get a recession, there's going to be a less less demand for goods and services, less demand for diesel, less demand for shipping stuff, less demand for electricity. Crude's probably going to get hit, right? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, like it already has been hit. Like, you know, actually, I think I think sentiment on crude is starting to bottom out a little bit. I think people are starting to get pretty bearish on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm getting a little bit more constructive on it, but I still think it does have some more downside um you know it doesn't act very well so yeah okay what 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 are some uh bets that you like in crude is it is it things like exxon or do you do you just play the the etfs you know i don't i don't trade a lot of oil um i don't have the the stomach or the constitution for it it's too volatile for me um you know, i've i actually have done it in the past with some success but you really like you have to have a very long-term outlook because you know with the price of oil moving around three to five bucks a day it's pretty easy to get shaken out of a position so yeah yeah okay maybe we can go into your um uh your awesome portfolio uh so basically you've got uh, um 20 percent stocks 20 percent bonds 20 percent cash 20 percent gold and 20 percent real estate and how has that performed uh, um, over the uh, last few decades? Well, going back to 1971, it has done 8.1% a year with half the volatility of an 80-20 portfolio, which is pretty darn good. Uh, and that's with a max drawdown of 12%, which was actually in 2022. Um, and even in, even in 2008, the drawdown of the awesome portfolio was about nine and a half percent. So if you think the way I think about the awesome portfolio is these are your, these are your choices. You can invest in the S and P 500 and have nine and a half percent returns with huge amounts of volatility, or you can invest in the awesome portfolio with 8% returns and half the volatility. So would you be willing to trade off one and a half percent returns for your, for a huge reduction in volatility. And like, this is kind of like my philosophy on investing in general. Like if you invest in an index like the S&P 500, the returns are great, the returns are fine. But when you invest in an index, you get the volatility of the index and you get huge drawdowns. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's difficult to stay invested. Um, with something like the awesome portfolio, you trade a little bit off in terms of returns, but you you massively reduce the volatility and the drawdowns and you can stay invested over time. Okay. Okay. Now the, the, the one fifth of bonds is that, does that adjust as time goes on? You know, like right now you like the twos a lot, um, you know, but there could be a period where the twos aren't that great and the tens or the, or the twenties are pretty good. Well, that's actually, so the bond allocation actually goes in AGG or BND. So it's a total bond market index. Okay. So it's not even strictly rates, it's credit, it's mortgages, it's the whole bond market. So. Oh, okay. Interesting. And then with the 20% cash, is that straight cash or are you putting these on like rolling uh, like a treasuries? money market fund or T-bills or whatever, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. That goes pretty close in line with, uh, we had Brent Johnson on the show maybe a year ago or so. And uh, he did the same thing, leaving out the bond allocation. So it's 25 stock, uh, US stocks, 25% cash, 25% gold, 25% real estate. And then the, um, uh, but he did say in the cash, he's like, you know, that the cash is a loose term. He's like, most of that is in rolling treasuries. So uh, I think the two of you see pretty eye to eye on that. Um, okay, we got a question from Constantine here. Uh, Jared has written books about how to think about money in a healthy way that allows you to enjoy life. So could you ask him what strategies investors and speculators should have to stay, sa stay sane and happy as well as make money? I, I mean, that's the, that's the subject of my new book. That's no worries. That's really what it's about. <laughs> Tell us about I mean, the it's, book. It's, it's, yeah, it's kind of tough to, yeah. So, so basically what you're trying to do is to live a life with, without financial stress. Okay. And there's two sources of financial stress. There's debt and risk. Okay. So it's about, excuse me, minimizing your debt and minimizing your risk. And, you know, there's some pretty 
I mean, that's what I talk about in the book. Like, I, I mean, I have specific chapters on credit cards and mortgages and car loans and student loans and stuff like that. And on the risk side, I talk about how to build a portfolio that, you know, minimizes volatility, but that's basically it. You minimize your debt, you minimize your risk, you have a life without financial stress. Now, some people say, like, gee whiz, like if if you're poor and you're like you're living paycheck to paycheck, like isn't that stressful? And my answer to that is no, it's absolutely not stressful. If you don't ha if if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you don't have any debt and you don't have any risk, you're perfectly happy. You're fine. And as long as you have your job, and even if you lose your job, you get unemployment, so it's not the end of the world. So I know plenty of people who don't have any money and they don't have any financial stress at all. On the other hand, you have the richest man in the world, Elon Musk, buys Twitter with leverage and hit the collateral, his stock, Tesla stock, goes down 75% and he almost gets a margin call. The richest guy in the world almost blows himself up. Like he structured his life in such a way that he has a huge amount of financial stress and he's the richest guy in the world. So it, it's there's no bearing on how much money you have. It's all about how you structure your life. Yeah, that's very interesting. Okay, so by no worries, um, uh, debt and risk are the two biggest ones that will, will stress you out financially. Yep. Yeah, okay, I agree. You know, and running through the Rolodex of all the people that I've helped with their financial statements, I've never put it into words like that, but that's exactly why they're coming to me is because they have too much debt and they're trying to get out of that debt by taking some radical risk in some stock that they heard about uh, on the news or something to, to just get themselves out of it. That is, uh, that is very, very, very true. Uh, okay, let's uh, wrap up here. What, um, do you follow uranium at all? It has had a heck of a run uh, here in the last, uh, uh, I don't know, three months or so. What, um, do you follow uranium? Yeah, so I used to, I used to own CCJ. I don't own it at the moment. I'm pretty familiar with the uranium trade. Um, I think it's structurally sound. I think it should keep going. You know, the charts the charts still look good. Uh, technically, it looks good. Um, yeah, I'm still bullish. Okay, okay. <clears throat> it. Um, uh, I'm gonna pull up uh, the uh, chart right here on. Oh, I got to share screen. You got to be able to see it. There we go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this has been uh, quite the heck of a run. Um, how would you play this? Would you just uh, buy the uh, the physical commodity or or what uh, um, ETFs? Well, the problem the problem with uh, uranium is that there really aren't any good place to the good ways to play it. Like, um, I I don't think buying the actual commodity is a good idea for okay. a bunch of reasons. Kind of too complex for this. Um, you know, if you buy an ETF, a, a lot of the small cap uranium stocks are a little bit sketchy. I'm not a I'm not a big fan of that. I mean, really, the best way to own it is CCJ, but CCJ is a big, ugly company that makes bad decisions and consistently underperforms. So, you know, really, the people I know that are deep into uranium, they kind of do a combination of the three. Mm -hmm. um, so. Oops, I was going to pull up uh, CCJ Cameco real quick. Uh, where did it go? Well, that's all right. Okay, let's move on to uh, Bitcoin. Uh, this has had a heck of a run up uh, since, I don't know, it got down to about 16,000. Now we're up to 41. Uh, we said last week we thought we we're going to have a reversal here because we got RSI and MACD in the clouds, but it is just not obeying. Do you think this is kind of uh, following gold here or what? Uh, what do you see with Bitcoin? Um, well, I think I think all assets have kind of come up in the last couple of months since we've been pricing in rate cuts. But um, I can tell you that sentiment on Bitcoin is starting to get kind of hot. Um, I walked in this morning and my Twitter feed was full of like Bitcoin people doing victory laps. And, um, you know, you never like to see stuff like that. Yeah. So um, I'm actually kind of bearish in the short term, you know. OK, OK. All right. Yeah, we're in the same boat. We're in the same boat. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jared. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, we can get your book at buynoworries.com. Are there any other uh, uh, links you want us to uh, put in the show notes? No, that's good. Okay, good deal. 
Well, Jared, you have yourself a great rest of the day. Thank you for coming on the show. And thank you for tuning in. Uh, be sure to support the show, hit the like and the subscribe, and share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. Have yourself a great rest of the day, and we will talk to you next time.